Friends of Sing for Science, I would like to introduce you to D. Peter Schmidt. D is the host of the Science Friday podcast, Universe of Art. And D, how would you describe what it is you do for Science Friday? Yeah, I'm an audio producer for Science Friday, and then I host our spinoff podcast, Universe of Art. And it's kind of all about artists who use science to take their work to the next level. And it's a part of Science Friday. And if your listeners aren't familiar with Science Friday, we're kind of a long running science news show on WNYC. Science Friday, for those of you who don't know, sits atop what I would describe as the Mount Olympus of science podcasts. <laughs> You're very kind. So yeah, we try to cover as much of science as we can. So everything from like physics to like, I did a story once about artists who are like illustrating insect butts to like teach people more about um, entomology and stuff like that. So we try to cover as much as we can. Oh, the insect buttholes one. Yes, <laughs> the, yeah, exactly. The infamous. I, I was tempted to ask you to feature that one, but I didn't want to reveal what a freak I am. <laughs> and you know, that's the beauty of that piece is like anybody can be a fan of insect butts and maybe we're just all freaks together. Mm -hmm. um, but we just have such a rich archive of all these amazing kind of science arts crossover stories we've done over the years. And so universe of art is like kind of a place for us to feature this like wealth of stories we have on this topic. But our tagline for it is, is like artists who use science to take their work to the next level. You know, perhaps it might have been the obvious choice to feature one of the episodes you've done that are more focused on music. Like there's a great one about the phenomenon of loops in life and in music. Uh, though today, for our listeners, we are going to run the episode that you did about Star Trek. So what can you tell us about that one? So I'm also a musician. I've been working in science journalism for almost a decade. And just the more time I've spent talking to scientists, the more I've realized that the relationship between science and art is is just like so much closer than someone might think. Like society kind of wants you to think that these two things are completely unrelated and like in opposition with each other. Yeah. And just the years I've spent talking to scientists, it's just like so untrue and Related to this episode today, like I've talked to NASA scientists and they were inspired to do the work they're doing because of Star Trek. Wow. <laughs> like multiple NASA scientists have told me that I'm at NASA because of Star Trek. And so this is one of my favorite episodes and it features the scientific consultant for like all the Star Trek shows that are happening right now, which is like, I think there's like five different Star Trek shows happening right now. And she consults with the writers on all these shows to make sure like the science is accurate um, or at the very least plausible. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, there was like a recent episode that like Enterprise got near a ripple in space time and then it, they sent some music into it. And then like the whole crew got infected with like they could only talk in musicals. <laughs> And so <laughs> show tunes. Yeah. Show tunes like great American songbook type of uh, stuff. Whoa. So even if like it gets really ridiculous, the science is like at the very least <laughs> plausible or sound. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode and um, it actually it features D. It features the Star Trek science advisor and uh, Ira, actually Ira Flato from Science Friday. So please enjoy it. Star Trek does have a lot of that where there is a scientific problem the crew is faced with yeah. and they approach it as scientists. Yeah. And that's something, a role I play as well as a science advisor is to advise on what information you need and how you approach problems. Welcome to Universe of Art, a podcast from Science Friday and WNYC Studios about artists who use science to take their creations to the next level. I'm Science Friday producer D. Peter Schmidt. So I was started pretty young on Star Trek, and it's why my favorite science topic is probably space. And one of the secret sauces of Star Trek that I love is that you feel like you're learning about real science concepts amidst these really high stakes plot lines. And I never did that great in math and science in school, but watching Star Trek and the science it showcased, it really felt like its own education. So I was super pumped when I found out my coworker Kathleen Davis was producing a segment for Science Friday featuring a scientific consultant for a bunch of recent Star Trek shows, Discovery, Prodigy, Strange New Worlds. And before we get to that, I'm here with Kathleen to talk about how this segment came together. Hey, Kathleen. Hello. So are you a Trekkie? So I have to admit, I am not a Trekkie, but one of my favorite things in science is when science and pop culture intersect. So... That's why this story uh, really, really drew itself to me. Yeah, I mean, can you uh, tell us more about Aaron McDonald, the subject of today's episode? 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, I have to admit, not the most exciting uh, origin story for a segment, but um, <laughs> I did get <laughs> it's fine. I did get you know a pitch basically saying, "Hey, Star Trek has this new, very cool science consultant. Would you like to talk to her?" Um, and the more I looked into her, the more I was like, "Oh, she is." really cool. She, (laughs) you know, has so much background in space and physics, and she is the science consultant across the Star Trek series, which I didn't know this before going into this story. There are like several Star Trek TV shows going on at any given time. (laughs) There are like movies, there are, you know, comic books and video games, I think, too. It's Uh just bananas out there. Yeah, um, I was listening through this segment and she was like rattling off all the different TV shows and properties that happened. I was like, oh my God, she's right. Yeah, there are that many Star Trek <laughs> shows happening right now. Uh, also talk about Dream Job, at least for me. I'm a huge, I'm a huge Trek. Absolutely. But <laughs> <laughs> what was something broadly you learned about scientific consultants for TV shows that like you didn't know before or like the effect they have on them? I think the biggest thing for me was that you know, I always have this question of if you're a scientific consultant for, you know, a movie or a TV show, I mean, do you ever have to like acquiesce uh, (laughs) some real science because it doesn't look good or it doesn't, Mm. you know, translate well to the screen? And um, Aaron McDonald really said, you know, this is a series that does really value the scientific accuracy. And I think a lot of Star Trek fans are very interested in science. And so at that point, it's almost like if they get something wrong, you know, scientifically wrong on screen, (laughs) you know, the audience might call them out on it. And so I just thought that was a really interesting um, way of doing that because I don't think that's the same, you know, for other movies or TV shows necessarily. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Star Trek's pretty unique like that. Um, So you're not a Trekkie, but if you if you could be a consultant, an expert consultant for a TV show, what TV show would that be? It doesn't have to be science fiction or anything like that. Oh, that is so such a good question. Um, it's not a TV show per se. I love the Alien movies, oh, yeah. like mm-hmm. that first Alien movie with Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> oh my god, I love that movie so much. Um, so if I could like, you know, sit behind the scenes and, you know, throw in some real science to this like extraterrestrial story, that would just be my dream. (laughs) This is the second episode in a row where Alien has come up and I'm totally okay with that. It's one of my favorite movies. You can't compete with it. (laughs) It's one of the best out there. (laughs) Totally. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for putting this together, Kathleen. Thanks, Dee. And now here's Science Friday host Ira Flato speaking with Star Trek scientific consultant Aaron McDonald. There are a few pop culture franchises that do science quite like Star Trek. Space, a final frontier. Is there a more recognizable opening line on television? More iconic than that one, the Star Trek series released in 1966, starring William Shatner as Captain Kirk, Leonard Nimoy as Spock, and since then there have been a dozen shows exploring the Star Trek universe. Some have been live action, some animated, but all explore concepts in astrophysics. And when I watch these shows, you know, I love them. I always think, how accurate is the science in this franchise? It's an apt question for our next guest who's going to tell me all about it. Dr. Erin McDonald, scientific consultant for the Star Trek franchise. She has a PhD in astrophysics and she joins us from Los Angeles. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, Ira. I'm really honored to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you. Tell tell me a bit about your history as a science consultant for Star Trek. When did that all start? How did you get involved? Yeah, it's been going back till season three of Star Trek Discovery was when I came on, when they jumped forward to the future. Uh, My background, as you mentioned, is in astrophysics, particularly in gravitational waves. Um, I've always used science fiction to teach science. And when I left academia, I started giving talks at pop culture conventions, which sort of led me into the entertainment industry. That's terrific. We want to get our listeners in on this because I know we're going to melt the phone lines when I give out the phone number. <laughs> our number is 844-724-8255 uh, to talk about the the science that's in Star Trek or tweet us at SciFry. Um, were you always a big Trekker, Star Trek fan? 
Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really exposed to it until I was in college. I was doing my undergraduate degrees in physics and math. And in the Venn diagram of Star Trek fans and physics majors, there's a big overlap in the middle there. And so at our sort of college parties, we would watch Next Generation. And that was kind of my first exposure to it. And I fell absolutely in love with it. Uh, the big moment for me was when the 2009 Kelvin film came out. That was the night we all graduated. And so we did our big graduation. And then we went to the midnight premiere back when those were actually at midnight and surrounded by Star Trek fans, I realized, like, wow. these are my people. This is where it's at. How, and how many Star Trek shows are airing at the same time these days? Now, I think we've had five going. Um, so there's a lot different flavors, as you mentioned. Some are live action, some are animated, some are targeted at kids. Um, and what's great is that they all kind of have different flavors of science. They all approach their storytelling differently, as Star Trek always has. Yeah. So give me an idea of what a day in the life of a science consultant looks like. What kinds of things are you actually doing? Yeah, a lot of it is working directly with the writers and showrunners. And so they'll reach out to me if they have specific questions. And then I sometimes try to sit about once a week in the writer's room itself, uh, helping them break ideas if they have questions in the moment or come up with story um, concepts. You know, I work as a writer. I'm a big fan of science fiction anyway. So being able to help with that process. And then a big part of my job is literally just editing scripts, going through yeah. them and at the very minimum, making sure we don't say anything wrong. That's oh. <laughs> the big job. <laughs> what do you mean see, say anything wrong? For example... Uh, for example, like refer to our solar system or a star system as a galaxy. That's mm. a common mistake that happens in science fiction all the time. And getting those things conflated, you know, making sure we talk about planets the right way, making sure we talk about nebulas the right way. And, right. and you know, that they're just dust and gas and all of those little nuances that can sometimes slip by. You know, one of the central tenets of watching a film, a, a fiction film, is the willful suspension of your belief. Right. The, uh, Absolutely. Uh, how does that play into what you do and, and, and in Star Trek in general? Well, I think sometimes, you know, a lot of what I do when I say I don't want them to say anything wrong, sometimes we'll have great fun, fantastical storylines that isn't really rooted in science. And the advice is to just not try to explain it, because I think that's when that suspension of disbelief, when you're talking about a giant energy being that's grabbing a hold of the ship. Right. As soon as you start to apply science to it, that's when you're going to start to lose people. When if you just let it be, you could just ride the story. Do you, do you have a favorite science plot line you've consulted on? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a few. My first one was to do the big story arc for season three, which was called The Burn. And what I was brought on for was to really apply some science to the, the dilithium, which is a fictional Star Trek element that's been around since the 60s and, you know, plays a role in the technology of these starships. And I was able to kind of add on some wow. canonical explanations to it uh, that was really exciting and, and really special. And then in that same season, I also consulted on episode five, I believe, where they encounter a coronal mass ejection. And that was the first time that we've had one of those in Star Trek before. Wow, the, so that was fun. That is dilithium crystals. Really? Yeah. Where, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Do we do we have a history on that? Well, yeah, the, the first thing I had to establish was, is it dilithium or is it dilithium? Because ah. as many Star Trek fans who are also chemistry majors will point out that lithium does not allow itself to be combined in such a way. And so we established, nope, it is just called dilithium and it's its own thing. I came up with these subatomic particles that tap into subspace <laughs> to right. make the story work that way. You know, you, you talked about not just having to accept things when something big happens. You don't want to explain it. And I think one of those things that I've always wondered about, and we have gotten calls about in the past, is warp speed. Right? Yes. How do you, how do you survive going to warp speed? The human <laughs> body can't really take that kind of acceleration. No, this is true. I mean, the ships do have inertial dampeners, which is kind oh, of the equivalent of seatbelts. Yep. Inertial dampener. Yep, cuz inertia is the thing that's going to get you, right? right but right. uh when you do go to warp, the whole concept of warp drive mathematically is really interesting and it is actually possible. The concept is that you're building a bubble of space-time around your ship. So on the ship itself, you're still traveling. I mean, 
at the speeds they are much faster than we can conceive of now. But even then, they're not quite at the speed of light. And then the bubble of space time just carries the ship faster than light. Because in our rules of general relativity, nothing says that space time itself can't go faster Whoa. than the speed of light. It's just stuff oh, on I, the surface of it. I love that explanation. Let's go to, I'm going to hit, there are a couple of harder ones on the phone. I'm going to get them to ask oh, you. Great. Marty <laughs> in, in Ellenberg, Washington. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, especially since I just got a new knee, are the Borg really possible? Oh, the Borg, you yeah. Mean a, yeah. Tell us what the Borg are, if you will, first. Absolutely. So the Borg is probably something a lot of young Star Trek fans remember is the first thing that gave them nightmares. But it's essentially a sort of cybernetic species that goes around assimilating different cultures, and they incorporate a lot of technology into their beings. Uh, but the big thing that the Borg have that was kind of established in Star Trek Voyager in more detail is these nanoprobes. So these little itty bitty mechanical devices that swim throughout your bloodstream and coordinate all of the cybernetic implants that you've got. Uh, so I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't know if you have to worry about that with your knee. <laughs> yet. Um, but uh, but it's certainly interesting. And I think this idea of integrating, it's really biotechnology, yeah. right? Integrating yeah. robotics with our bodies. Uh, we are not far away from. Do, do you ever go in the opposite direction? Do you ever suggest something that they could incorporate into the script that you're thinking about? Um, Yeah, quite a few times. I mean, I don't want to take too much credit because these writers, you know, they come up with really, really cool stories. But like the CME, the coronal mass ejection that I mentioned, you know, that was a big one where it was like, let's just have a space disaster. We yeah. just want a cool space disaster that's going to interrupt the transporter. What would be a fun one that we could use with that? And so then we kind of built the story around it being a coronal mass ejection, which is for people who aren't aware, it's like a, a solar flare plus. It carries a lot of massive radiation particles in addition to the kind of normal solar flares that we see. Yeah, a lot of people want to talk to you. Let's go to uh, Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Jeff, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, yeah, thanks. I'm reading a series of books now, and um, they use something called an Alcubier drive. I supposedly it's a real theoretical thing. And I was just wondering, is that the same thing as the warp drive? Yeah, absolutely. So the Alcubera drive was kind of the first major warp drive that was mathematically laid out. And so as I talked about where um, warp is about building a bubble of space time around your ship, the Alcubera drive takes that concept. And uh, this warp drive, the Alcubera drive, right. could work. The issue is the amount of energy required to do it because mass bends space-time. That's the bowling ball on the trampoline analogy. Right, right. Um, if you don't have that mass to build a warp bubble, you need an equivalent amount of energy, which you know is times the speed of light squared. So that's that's a level of energy we don't know how to harness yet. So that's the barrier that's keeping us from getting there. Hmm. You have to keep up with all these things, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes the writers get to it before I do. You know, a lot of the writers love science. They're really interested in it. And so I'll pop into a writer's room and they'll be like, hey, Aaron, tell us about this new black hole finding. And I've got to go look it up. And, you know, it's it's really cool. It's great to have a team that's so invested in science as mm. well. Dr. McDonald, do you ever view this as more than just a science fiction thingy, but maybe a teaching experience? Oh, absolutely. I think it's it's hard to undersell how influential Star Trek has been on science. You know, it's been around for gosh, 60 plus years at this point, and it has influenced and inspired people to become scientists. And so there is some responsibility to uphold that legacy of uh, inspiring people and getting the science correct. And particularly with the new show, Star Trek Prodigy, which is targeted at kids, you know, a lot of that is actually more of a teaching job and leaning on my teaching background to try to explain difficult concepts to kids and hopefully inspire them to become scientists. Yeah, because it can inspire a lot of people to think about the laws of physics. I mean, yeah. and seriously, I mean, let me go to, for example, my next caller. Let's go to Nicholas in New Bedford, Mass. Hi, Nicholas. Hi. Go ahead. So in the latest season of Star Trek Discovery, we see the ship go past the edge of our galaxy into another galaxy where the laws of physics seem to differ very greatly. Now, is this some way, something theoretical? Is there actually 
evidence that suggests that in another galaxy, but still in our same universe, there could be very different laws of physics. Understood. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that question. So yeah, in season four of Star Trek Discovery, the crew go past the galactic barrier, which was inspired from all the way back to the original series. And then they enter a what's actually a star system where species 10C lives. And what the species 10C has done is they create a bubble that's almost like a Dyson Sphere Plus that surrounds the entire star system and is protecting them from the outside. So that was more on the science fiction side. It's always a bit of a spectrum, but was fun about exploring the galactic barrier because that was more on the legacy of Star Trek. Uh, We did actually try to look up if there was any science based on that. And just really quickly, you know, we do have this thing called the heliopause at the edge of our solar system where radiation particles from the sun kind of get stopped because they don't have enough escape velocity to fully escape our solar system and the gravity well of the star. And I was thinking like, well, what if there's something similar similar at the edge of our galaxy, the uh, like galactopause, if you will. And actually, since we kind of were coming up with that idea, I did actually see a paper uh, hit the preprint archive on the idea of a galactopause. And so <laughs> this idea that there is radiation particles. Now, it's not so much that the laws of physics in the species 10C star system had changed, but more that they had created an environment in which they could live and be protected from the exterior intergalactic space. Very well put. And that's like a master's thesis right there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a lot of science in one sitting, I know. <laughs> I, I want to talk about data because data is, I think, one of the unique things about uh, Star Trek uh, you know, data for for both of you who've been in in a cave for decades, data is is a, a an android. He's a key star in Star Trek, and his desire to become more human all the time is giving him a personality now less science fiction like and more science present. Do you think? I do think so. And, uh, you know, for people who might not be aware, I I could recommend it's in my top five episodes of Star Trek to watch is The Measure of a Man from an original series or from the next generation, excuse me, that explores the rights of data. And I think watching that with a context now that we have with artificial intelligence and these great strides that are happening faster than we can keep up with is even more interesting than it even was back in the day because it really forces you to think about the rights of artificial intelligence. And I do think this is a conversation that we're going to be having for a long time. It is going to dominate our culture in the next decade. Kurt in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Hi, Kurt. Yes, hello. Hi there, go ahead. Uh, Well, I was just wondering, through all the different shows and the exploration that they represent and everything that they do in the universe, uh, I was just wondering, how come you don't really see a whole lot of uh, exploration or explanation around trying to understand black holes? You you, you do, but you can't see it. No, that was a bad joke. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we do do try to incorporate some of that. I mean, thinking about the history of sort of science. I talked about how science is integrated with Star Trek for so long. One of the cool things is that uh, in the original series back in the 60s, we still hadn't detected a black hole. It hadn't even been coined in the literature. And I think Captain Kirk at one point says that there was like a void of blackness in space. And within a year, the term black hole had been coined in publications, which is a bit chicken in the egg. We don't really know which came first with that one. Um, But we have tried to integrate some and even with things that we've discovered through gravitational waves, we're starting to build out our pictures of black holes even just better than we knew 10, 15 years ago. And so those start to fold into our stories a little bit more, this idea of roaming black holes. And yeah, obviously you have to have some visual imagery that's going to be fun to go with it. In the recent season, season one of Strange New Worlds, they actually escape Uh, an enemy. I won't spoil it too much. They escape an enemy Mm. by utilizing gravitational time dilation and slingshotting around a black hole. So it's all about just trying to find the right scientific phenomena that fits the story. You're never fearful of going through your wormholes, though, right? Star Trek goes through wormholes a lot. Exactly. In fact, Deep Space Nine was pretty much set at a wormhole. (laughs) Here you go. Jerry in Hebrew Spring, Arkansas. Welcome to Science Friday. Hey, so I got just kind of an off-the-wall question. It's more in like personalities and technology, but for your, your guests there, has there ever been anything that was presented by a writer or the staff where you just went, ah, yeah, no, that's not going to work? 
<laughs> I appreciate that question. <laughs> I do, do you have think... that power? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I will say, you know, I do think it's important as a science advisor to be a positive force in the room and to not squash people's dreams and ideas. And so I try to take a yes and approach to story ideas that are presented to me. And, you know, sometimes it's more important to just say, like, that's a really cool idea. Let's not explain it. It's Let's not. just let that be. Um, and uh, and try to adjust as necessary to what we do know in science. Yeah, well, big, um, because uh, Rich in the, was it your Belinda, California, is going to ask about something like that. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, thanks. Um, my question was, how legit legitimate is the uh, transporter and the replicator, and what kind of science do you uh, justify uh, that whole concept? <laughs> I love, I love the transporter. Okay, I'll make this really brief. So the transporter with our physics knowledge we have now could never work because you break down all of the particles of the body down to almost a subatomic particles, and you have to know exactly where they are to put them back together. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is a physics concept, doesn't allow that. The more you know about where a particle is, the less you know about the speed it's going. And then there's an ultimate Heisenberg like limit that you can't reach. Um, but in Star Trek The Next Generation, they're repairing the transporter at one point, And there's a Heisenberg compensator. Oh, wow. And that compensates for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And how does the Heisenberg compensator work? It works very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be right back after this break. Have you had moments where you've actually had to change the science because it's not working for the story? You know? Yeah, actually, we did. In Discovery, there was one time where they were trying to escape what we had, the dark matter anomaly, and they were writing the gravitational waves out of it, which is my technical scientific background. Yeah. And uh, gravitational waves don't exactly work the way we were visualizing it. The visuals, as they're all standing around the, the table, you know, in the ready room, trying to plan this, uh, were looking like ocean waves. And gravitational waves really look more like sound waves, like compression waves that are right. happening in multiple dimensions. And so they tried, to their credit, they tried to image it correctly, like gravitational waves look, and it immediately pulled people out because you hear wave and you expect to see something. And so we decided to just leave it looking like an ocean wave because it wasn't worth the time and explanation it would take to explain to people why it looked that way. Gotcha. They're just trying to say they're going to ride the yeah. waves out. Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey in Pittsburgh, welcome to Science Friday. Hello, Dr. McDonald. Thank you for the very entertaining and interesting conversation. My Mine is a comment and then a quick question. As an emergency physician and somebody that's old enough to be a fan of the original Star Trek, a medical tricorder was fascinating to me. And as I see patients today in my practice, it occurred to me that with the micronization of sensors as well as uh, artificial intelligence machine learning, we're getting close faster than I think most people realize to a an early medical tricorder and Dr. McDonald with your access to the uh, scientists that you uh, talk to um, what are your thoughts on that yeah good question thanks doc yeah I mean you know what's interesting is I do think necessity drives invention and in the last couple years we've been at a place where we've had to have more remote medical diagnostic capabilities where you're able to diagnose people from a distance or without touching them. And then also technologies. I mean, I'm wearing a device on my wrist that's measuring my heart rate, you know, is measuring my pacing and all of those. And so, yeah, certainly our technology is getting us there. And I think even a few years ago, it's probably close to a decade now, um, there was an X prize to try to develop a device that could diagnose, I think it was like five vital signs and diagnose 12 diseases and someone did win that it's just at the time prohibitively large and expensive but the technology does exist and i do think you know as as you mentioned uh the miniaturization of technology will get us there as well as well as machine learning you know i kind of think that uh, you you touched on this before a little bit about science education but i think you know speaking and talking about these things actually makes some of them happen. I'm thinking of the first flip phone, right? That Motorola flip 
flip phone was based on Star Trek, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone wanted to pop open that phone and call the Enterprise. <laughs> and, and it drives that. And I, I also, the one I think of, too, is when we all started getting e-readers. Those were the exact <clears throat> shape and size of the data pads in the next generation. Yeah. And you can't avoid the fact that people are watching this on Star Trek or any science fiction and think... I really want that. Uh, and then they work toward it and they end up inventing these things. Cool. Comment from Dan on Twitter who says, I teach a first year college course called Science Fiction, Science Fact. And we watched some episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation to discuss the importance of science fiction in understanding science. Which episodes would you recommend for teaching science? I love Measure of a Man on Data. Oh, that's a great question. Um... Oh, there's so many good ones. <laughs> it's like the yeah. science is so embedded in the DNA of Star Trek. You know, my personal favorite episode of Star Trek f f ever is Voyager's Counterpoint. And that's where Janeway is trying to discover where a wormhole is going to appear. And it's not so much about educating like what a wormhole is, but I think seeing scientists science and Star Trek does have a lot of that where there is a scientific problem the crew is faced with yeah. and they approach it as scientists. Yeah. And that's something a role I play as well as a science advisor is to advise on what information you need and how you approach problems. You know, I see the evolution, so to speak, of Star Trek from the Kirk days where they would they would settle things by fighting out in the back lot someplace on a cheap set, right? <laughs> yeah. That's how they settled things. And then they got more cerebral yeah. later, right? But, but Picard solved everything with his brain. He came, he outsmarted you. He outthought <laughs> you, right? Yeah, absolutely. They all have their own little approaches. And you mentioned the, you know, fighting on the planet with fisticuffs. But in that episode in Arena, Spock and McCoy are up watching this fight go on and be like, he's not going to figure it out. He's got to do the chemistry. He's got to do the science. And Wait, he eventually figures it out. If you could move Star Trek in some generation, some direction, I mean, where would you like to see it go? Um, I've really enjoyed um, Prodigy and reframing these classic Star Trek ethos, like you said, the philosophical as well as the problem solving and the scientific to be targeted at kids and seeing more of that, having these more hard sci-fi shows that are accessible and available to kids, I think really can influence an entire generation and how they, you know, decide to pursue their careers. Is there a, is there a teaching Material. I mean, did they make teaching materials out of Star Trek episodes that they could use in schools? Maybe they should be doing that. I mean, I've heard, I've certainly heard a lot of um, teachers, as as the you know commenter mentioned, who use science fiction. And in fact, I did as well. And for Star Trek Prodigy, we also did a series of webisodes that people can watch. That was the science of Star Trek Prodigy, where we did short five, 10 minute um, explainers of the science in these episodes. So people can go and find them there, you know, where you watch Prodigy and they're also available streaming online um, because we do want to find ways to teach through Star Trek. I think it is so effective. Yeah, it is. And, and I guess once you get hooked on Star Trek, you're hooked. You're hooked. You're hooked. So, <laughs> so if you get hooked on, you know, because kids are natural born scientists. They want to know how everything works. They want to take it all apart. They'll make mistakes. And you kind of get that uh, you kind of get that vibe from Star Trek. So, absolutely, yeah, I agree. We're all we're all scientists at heart, you know. Starting out, we we problem solve. Dr. McDonald, good luck. You have an envi enviable job, I think. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Aaron McDonald, science consultant for the Star Trek franchise, based in Los Angeles. Thank you for taking time and sharing what you know. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Universe of Art is hosted and produced by me, D. Peterschmidt, and I also wrote the music. The original segment you just heard was produced by Kathleen Davis, and our show art is illustrated by Abel Hayford. And support for Science Friday Science and Arts coverage comes from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Also, if you have an idea for a future episode of Universe of Art, send us an email or a voice memo to universe at sciencefriday.com. We'll be back in two weeks. See ya!